Hello. Um, it's my great pleasure to be able to introduce Dr. Carla Cheatham. Um, I've attended a number of her presentations, and you guys are in for a real treat. Um, she began her career in psychosocial services, followed by 10 years as an interfaith healthcare chaplain and management coordinator. She publishes books and videos about healthy leadership and organizations, resilience, communication, boundaries, trauma-informed care, grief, service recovery, emotionally competent professionals and teams, and much more. She is a national keynote speaker and consultant focusing on emotionally intelligent and resilient professionals and organizations. And we are so privileged to have her here today. Thank you. And please give a warm welcome to Dr. T. for your patience and perseverance and continuing to work together to make certain that this event happened and that I could be here with all of you today. Um, let me ask this, how many of you are here today as private or family caregivers? All right, and how many of you are, of you are here as uh, leaders or managers? And how many are here as case managers? Excellent, and where are my social workers? Fantastic. And uh, psychotherapist, mental health, wonderful. And uh, hospice palliative care peeps, excellent, yes. And uh, other nursing or physicians or other types of clinical folks, excellent. And clergy, chaplains, fantastic, welcome. And who have I missed? Who is here that I've not mentioned? All right, well. It gives me a bit, of a, a bit of a better idea of who is in the room. So ordinarily, when I talk about boundaries, I talk about, well, I'll talk about it today. But I want to be really clear that usually we talk about boundaries within the context of rather typical caregiving. And I don't know if you've noticed, but we're not exactly in typical times right now. And so as we are going through the, pardon the chaplain's language, but the shit show dumpster fire of this <laughs> pandemic. <laughs> Whoo, baby, Jesus, help me. <sighs> Boundaries can feel even different. We already, many of us it seems, are accustomed to working with people that are living with a chronic illness and that are sometimes facing their worst and looking for their best in the midst of their worst. And we know what it's like to care for people and to want to love on them and want to be present for them, but also the need to take care of ourselves and to keep ourselves from getting into compassion fatigue and burnout. And to prevent, to protect them from our well-meaningly overstepping into over-functioning and helicopter parenting the hell out of them by over-functioning and doing too much in a way that devalues their role as the hero of their own journey. And so when we talk about boundaries, typically it already can be challenging because you want to start bringing up everyone's adolescent issues, start telling them what they can and can't do. Case in point, masking and protecting those around us who are vulnerable. And so we see this all the time. But boundaries are not so much, the way I speak about them, are not so much about what you can and can't do. It's about relationship. Right relationship with ourselves, right relationship with others in a way that is the most life-giving and helpful and free. Swiss researchers wanted to test this idea of boundaries and what it does to the human psyche. And so they took school children that were at the school where the playground, they knew roughly where the boundaries of the playground were, that tree over there and that field over there and those bushes over here. 
but there wasn't a clear fence. And so they watched, they observed, these researchers, and the children would play clustered up against the back of the building. And then they put in a fence that clearly indicated where the boundaries were. And you know what happened. The kids scattered. They used the whole playground because they didn't have to worry that they were going to overstep. They didn't have to worry that they were going to do something wrong. They didn't have to worry or be concerned that they were going to do something that was going to get them in trouble or cause an issue or cause a problem or be dangerous. They had the freedom to move around the whole playground. And so that's what we're looking for, is the freedom for the persons that we're caring for, the care recipients that we're caring with, and ourselves, and then amongst ourselves and our colleagues, how we have relationships that value everyone, devalue no one, keep everyone right-sized, and give us the freedom to engage in a way that is the most life-giving and supportive and affirming and empowering of them, while also protecting us from picking up grief after grief after grief after grief until we just can't handle it anymore. Because now, near the pandemic, we're not just talking about, about burnout, which is about workplace conditions. And we're not just talking about compassion fatigue, when we're giving, 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 and the glycogen stores and our muscles go, I ain't got nothing left to give. So our compassion muscles poop out and there's nothing left for us to give. We're talking now about moral distress. We're talking about moral injury. We're talking about primary and secondary and vicarious trauma. We've been talking too, recent, in recent months, back to the point about people's struggles with respecting boundaries that honor and protect and support one another. I know for me, with my clients across the country and my students, this last surge brought them to their knees. Because I've been doing the trauma debriefs for the clinical staff working in the COVID units bedside since well before most people knew the pandemic was happening. I teach with the University of Maryland for their Master's of Science and Power of Care program. And I have students all over the world. And we had students that were on the border of China deciding who got in and who got out were testing for this really concerning virus back in December of 2019. And so went to colleagues in the Toronto healthcare system that were at the epicenter of SARS-1 and said, this is not going to be good, is it? And I said, no, it's looking like it's not going to be. I said, what do we do? Y'all have already been here back in 2003. What do we need to know? I said, well, the main thing, how do we, how do we adapt the material that we've been teaching? What do I do to best support and prepare us to not just do what I talk about, not just survive, but actually thrive through this time? And I said, well, here's a little research you definitely want to know. And it shows this. After the end of SARS-1, the peak burnout rates for the frontline workers were not immediate. They came 18 to 36 months after the end of the pandemic because we don't process trauma while we're in it. We're surviving. Our lizard brains are working hard and fast to take care of us. It's not until we finally can go, okay, it's, it's better now. Not like, really, really, there's not gonna be another because we're kind of, everyone I know right now is holding their breath to see what Omicron's gonna do because we're just not sure. We know it's highly transmissible, we don't know how, we don't know how um, deleterious it is to the, to the persons who do, who do contract it. But once we do get to that place of the new normal and we can finally go, that's when our adrenals poop out. We can stop being on guard now? Okay, good. Got nothing left. And that's when we can begin to process what it is that we've been through. And so, I don't say that to come in and be like, who brought her in to be the Debbie Downer? <laughs> um, but just to kind of state the name of the elephant in the room, of the conditions within which we're working and living professionally and personally. Because the boundaries that I talk about are designed not just to protect them, but are designed to protect us. And to help cut the us keep going in a way that we can be sustainable in the long term for the marathon. We talk to people that we're caring for all the time. Don't flame out all at once. This is a marathon, not a sprint. Take care of yourself, right? 
how good are we at do as I say and not as I do? Talking to them about taking care of ourselves and of themselves, but then we show up as a hot mess at the bedside. So we'll talk a little bit too about embodying what it is we're wanting to teach them about the boundaries of caring for ourselves even while caring for others. And so we talk about how we do all of these things to protect them and to protect us because we know that we're going to need the space to care for ourselves and each other for the next couple of years, two to three years at least, as we support ourselves through the recovery of what I'm saying is going to be the potential for a revolution. Everything has been churned up. So tsunami, the tsunami comes in and dredges all the sediment and all the stuff up. And what it can do, though, is it gives us a chance to rebuild with some really amazing fertilizer. When that sediment comes through and can provide new growth. So we talk about trauma. We talk about post-traumatic growth. And post-traumatic growth isn't just false positivity. It's not this toxic positivity of Pollyannish, everything's fine, it's all puppies and ponies. No, no, it's not. And in the midst of the challenges that we have faced and are facing, there is tremendous opportunity. And that opportunity to practice the emotional intelligence and the resilience that will allow us to achieve post-traumatic growth on the other side of this by finding a new source of meaning by finding a new way of understanding what it is that we have faced and finding a new way of believing in the world when what we thought and hoped and wanted the world to be gets smacked upside the head with reality. I did, um, because I teach this stuff, I actually practice it, because if I don't, you'll smell a frog a mile away and I'll be the one up here looking like a dumpster fire going, trust me, take care of yourself, it works. <laughs> and and so I did really, 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 really well at practicing what I teach. Um, I would do trauma debriefs, but since I was working remotely and not flying all over the country, I was, um, I was staying at friends' places, house-sitting for people in Colorado or Utah or Wyoming, and I would stay there and felt a little guilty because I was like escaping Texas during the apocalypse. Sorry. <laughs> um, but, you know, what we do with privilege Having privileges is the problem is what we do with it. And so I decided I wanted to use that privilege and be able to be there to do intense work and then go get my butt on my mountain bike and to go hike a mountain bike through the mountains and to get my own stuff together so that I could come back and suit up and show up for people doing the worst of the worst of the front lines every single day. And so I did really well at bouncing that for a long time. And then this most recent search came and it took me to my knees. And I did... I, I knew that I was getting crispy, crispy critter not fit for human consumption. I knew it. I heard it. I felt it. I would reread my Facebook post and go, oh, mm -mm, no, no, that's not how I speak. <laughs> delete, delete. Well, I might keep that one. Yeah, no, no, no. Delete. You're banned from Facebook until you're in a better place. And I was struggling. Uh, because for me, I've had the belief that if people know that they're doing something to hurt someone else, they'll stop. And if they know that there's something they can do to protect and take care of someone else, they'll do it. And I don't want to get into the political you know, debate if there are others who disagree with me. But for me, I felt like I was patching people up just to send them back into the fire. While other people kept resetting it. And then attacking them in the process. And I knew I was crispy, and so I put on all my autoresponders. I took off from I also leading the congregation this year, uh, doing the interim ministry, and I, I, I put on all the autoresponders. I took off from the church. I did all the things, and I was just closing my work laptop, my work email, when one more client digged through and said, we've got an emergency. We really need you. Two of the nurses in our inpatient units, a mother and a daughter, both have COVID and they're both in the ICU and they're both on vents. And the mom was seven months, the, the younger one's seven months pregnant, they had to take the baby and the baby's now in the NICU on BiPAP. And our team, we're, we're broken and we need you. Can you please schedule some time to do some debrief with us and support us? And it was one of those moments where I teach, can I? Should I? Do I have this to give? I've already set the boundary. I'm already really clear that I don't have this to give. 
And I sat with it, and I sat with it, and I sat with it. And it finally, and who could I refer them to? Because we're not indispensable, someone else can. But on the fly, I could not think of anyone that was available, that knew them well enough, that had the skills that they needed, and I just didn't. So I finally made the decision going, this might hurt, but I need to do this. And so I made the decision to go ahead and do it. And whew, I'm great, grateful that I did. And ah. so I went to go mountain biking and hiking, and I couldn't. I was too soul exhausted and beaten up and more. I couldn't. I didn't have the energy to get on the bike. I did a couple of rides and a couple of hikes. The rest of the time, I sat my butt on a rock in the mountains and in the desert, and I sat. And when it came time to, to break camp on a Sunday evening to come home, I broke out into the big old Oprah ugly cry. <laughs> Snot slinging up. I really do. Call my therapist, call my Alan sponsor. I did all the things. I can't do this. I can't come home. I'm not ready yet. And so I was already scheduled to come and uh, house ranch sit for some friends out in Blanco who they were going to be gone um, for a few weeks. And I called them and said, I'm not even going home. I'm coming straight there to your back porch. And I went to their back porch, a couple of physicians of palliative care. I went to their back porch and I sat in their back porch from the sun up until midnight for days on end. And I rocked in that rocking chair. And I kept my autoresponders on, and I called some peeps and said, I need some more time. And I let my friends know, don't expect much from me for the next few weeks. I need some more time. And, um, and I got, you know, I still got work done, got some things that I needed to be done, but mostly I, I unplugged still a little longer. And I sat in that rocking chair, and someone said, what did you do in the rocking chair all day long? And it was those big rocking chairs. You know, they kind of go so far back, you think you're going to flip over. But you don't, and you're like, oh. And it goes that bit, just so soothing. Like, literally soothing. Do you want to talk about the vagus nerve and all the response, their parasympathetic response? And I said, well, I cried. I cussed. I cried some more. I prayed. I cussed some more. Actually, I think it's all praying. And, and I, just, I just did that until I got out of my system. Because I needed to grieve the loss of what we call, in grief work and trauma work, the loss of my assumptive world. With me, social workers? The loss of my assumptive world, the way that I had hoped and wanted and needed the world to be or thought the world was, got smacked in the face reality. And I saw the impact of what it was doing to kill people that I was caring for and supporting. And I needed to come to terms with that. I needed to find a new space of, of being and believing. And so I grieved. And I grieved, and post-traumatic growth is about acknowledging the threat to our existential beliefs. It is about finding a new source of meaning. It is about reclaiming the narrative and restoring the nightmare to find a new story. While also accessing support within ourselves, with each other, and with something transcendent beyond us. Whatever that is to you. And I did that. I came, I, I, I grew up that young part of me that just wants it all to be fine and everybody just get along. And she got a little more mature, but I didn't want her to get cynical. I don't want to let go of believing and hoping and trusting in people. But I got to remind myself that people are basically good, people will basically do things to support and help each other. And sometimes when we're scared enough or radicalized enough or feel pushed against the wall enough, we will do what we feel like we need to do to take care of ourselves, even at the detriment of others. And that all get to be true. And that it can be okay. And that I can be okay in the midst of it. And so as I went through that grieving process, I came back going, I think that's the key of what we get to do. We need to give ourselves safe space to name our experience, to name our disappointments and frustrations, and give ourselves room to Grieve. And in order to do that, we have to be able to have some boundaries of accepting that we are not indispensable. I saw a meme once that said, you are killing yourself for a job that if you were to die, they would have you replaced before your funeral. And as soon as I posted it on social media pages, Jenny knows where those are, someone said, immediately chimed in the comments and wrote, if, if you die, about when you die, we are not indispensable. 
We are not indispensable. I now have a list of people that I can call as backups if I'm in that situation again. Because I'm not indispensable. There are other people who could have cared for them. I just couldn't think of it in the moment. And so we find the redundancy in the systems and we accept that we're not powerful enough to make or break situations. And so we get to have the boundaries that say, I need to step away for a bit of time so that I can come back. How many are sing singers in here? Yeah, so if you've sung in choirs, you know that if you all take a breath at the same time, it sounds kind of weird. <laughs> and so you stagger your breathing. You find different people take breaths at different times. Even during times of war and the front lines, you refresh your troops from that time to time. Even in the COVID units, you refresh your frontline folks from time to time. Even in the trenches that we are working in every day, we have to find ways to step back and leave a vacuum and have others step in and trust that they will so that we can tend to ourselves and that then we come back. And so that's part of what I want us to acknowledge and be with today when we talk about boundaries. Is I was doing a trauma debrief for a bunch of APRNs, uh, advanced practice nurses out of New York, and was talking about boundaries, a lot of what we're going to be talking about here. And I talked about self-care as not just being a good fuzzy woo-woo idea, but as self-care as being our greatest clinical competence. Because I can have all the best tools in the toolbox. I can have all the best mnemonics, all the best protocols. I can know all the theories. I can know all the things. But if I am not grounded and centered well enough to wield those tools well, I will be ineffective at least and dangerous at worst. And none of us got in this field to be dangerous. Self-care is not just a good idea. It is our greatest <coughs> clinical competence. And she said, I've been a nurse for 23 years and no one has ever told me that not only do, not only do I have permission to do self-care, it's a requirement, it's a responsibility. I said, yeah. And she said, even during a pandemic? And I said, oh, honey, especially during a pandemic. So, do this for me, please. Let's count to 10 as a group. We'll go from one through 10. Um, if two people sp speak at the same time, then we need to go in order. If two people speak at the same time, we'll start over. Go. One, one. Start over. One, one. Start over. One, one. Start over. One, one. Start over. There we go. So, so 
So in the midst of the rush, in the midst of this is a this is frantic, this is urgent, this is an emergency, we get we get hyped up too. And we come and we go running in and we go jumping in and we go and we don't slow down and wait. Remember, grounded and centered to wield those tools well. So do this with me, please. Take a big, big deep breath. Let it out. Now we're going to do that again, but this time we're going to breathe in for four, hold for seven, breathe out for eight. Ready? One, two, three, four. Fill up big. Hold for seven, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Out for eight. Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. With a big breath in for four. One, two, three, four. Hold. Two, three, four, five, six, seven. Seven, out for eight. Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Four, seven, eight, breathing. It's a brilliant technique to pretty quickly reset our central nervous system. And when we do get into that <gasps> fight, fight, or freeze, sympathetic arousal, that's a really good way to hit the reset button on the parasympathetic relaxation response to calm us down. So having a moment of pause to go, I feel myself hooked into that energy. Mm -hmm. bring a different energy into it, which is better for them and better for me and keeps me more clear-headed rather than getting caught up into that crisis arousal. Where I'm not thinking as clearly, I'm not as present, and presence in and of itself is healing. So the more we are able to just be grounded and centered and present, the better we can be for others in that situation. Often it's much less about what we do, and it's more important the energy that we bring to be that non-anxious presence in the room. Because in a panic, everyone's looking around for the grown-up room in the room. And often when we're going, where's the grown-up in the room? We're like, it's me. <laughs> and so then more than ever is when we need to have that moment of pause to really be ready to be present and grounded. So, so we center ourselves. And another thing that we do with clear boundaries is we communicate clear. So, one to ten, different people have to say, you can't just have one person go all the way in a row, we're gonna go all the way from one to ten, two people <coughs> talk at the same time, you start over, go. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Start over. One, two, three, You have the calm part better, and we got further, right? Now think back to the clear communication piece. Go. One. Two. Three. Start over. Clear communication. unspoken dynamics, unspoken rules about the limits in the relationship between us as care providers and they as care recipients. It is about the balance between the power differential because when we are the care provider and they are the care recipient, there is 
no amount that we can do to completely erase that power differential. They're always going to be in a bit of a one down. But it doesn't mean we don't try. We do everything we can to empower and equip them to honor their position of authority and power as the person about whom everything else revolves. Because this is about them and not about us. But they still are in need of something from us. We have unique access to the right forms, to the right systems, to the right medications, to the right resources and services. And so there's going to be a bit of a power differential and we need to protect them from us unintentionally misusing that power differential in a way that harms them, and again, has us over function. When I, was, uh, when I went, was in Northeast Texas going through my undergraduate psychology, our professor, we would constantly ask our professors, all of them, and also I did my master's degree in psychology as well, and we would ask our professors, how do we know when we're over functioning? And they would repeatedly say, when you are doing for someone else what they are capable of doing for themselves, you are doing too much. And if they are capable of learning and achieving the skills and the resources to be able to do for themselves, then your job is to give those things to them and then step back and let them do for themselves. Because if we can teach them to do for themselves rather than jumping in and doing it, we serve them far better and also serve us. And so we're looking for a safe connection with others in a way that meets their needs while also protecting them and again protecting us. We get to honor the fact that boundaries aren't just the, you know, you can't tell me what to do, but boundaries are about the gift of knowing where the limits are, trusting another person to find their way, knowing that they are the expert, constantly asking ourselves, am I here to try to help them, hands down, or am I here to empower them, hand up? And so we ask ourselves constantly, who is the hero of their journey? So when I talk about boundaries, I just put it simply like this. We are to do nothing for, their, for our benefit at their expense, including anything that is financial, sexual, emotional, or spiritual. Because when I first got asked to do a boundaries training about uh, 12 years ago for the Texas New Mexico Hospice Organization, Randy Baker came and asked me to do a presentation on that. I was like, mm, nope, nope, uh -uh, not doing it. So I worked in child family therapy in Northeast Texas for years, and also and a lot of my jobs have been working for the state. And I had to do boundaries training every year, and not stick a fork in my eyeball. <laughs> I did not want to. I did not want to, you know, perpetrate on others the harm that had been done to me by going to these boundaries trainings, where they assumed I was going to screw up before I even had a chance to. It could be condescending. It was very scolding. It would use this threatening kind of atmosphere and it was all about don't have sex with them and don't take money so i first started off the first boundary training i did by saying we know not to have sex with patients and families right please say yes <laughs> <laughs> and we know not to take money for patients and families right right i said if you don't know a and b come see me afterwards you've got bigger problems and i said but today what we're going to talk about and what we're going to talk about today is those boundaries that we cross emotionally, spiritually, when we come to our work empty and we need it to fill us up to make us feel okay about ourselves. Yeah, I told you I'd start stuff on some more toes. Mm -hmm. Including my own. Why do you think I say all this stuff? I need to hear myself say it. And where do you think I learned all this stuff? By screwing it up repeatedly and being that toxic person on the team that everybody else is like, dang, who's gonna talk to her about that? <laughs> And so when I come to work empty and I need work to fill me up to make me feel okay about myself, I will get hooked, I will overstep, I will over-identify, I will over-function, I will overdo, I will not notice, I will pay attention, I'll do more than my colleagues, which disrespects and devalues them, I will get them overly dependent upon me, which sets them up to fail, because when I'm not there, then where's their hero? Because I forgot to empower them to be their own hero so that when I'm gone, their hero has left because they're their hero. But when I come to work full of my own disciplines, my people who love me, even on the days when I am a crispy critter not fit for human consumption, and I show up to work full of my own disciplines and self-care and the things that I need to do so I'm here, I'm good, I'm grounded, then I can show up to work and simply allow it to be fulfilled, which is a subtle but significant difference from needing it to fill me up to make me feel okay about myself. 
And that comes and goes. It depends upon the day. It depends upon the time. It depends upon the year and where I am. But I notice the times when, you know those clients that are the good kind of crazy, you're kind of crazy, the familiar kind of crazy, but I like them. Why do they feel so comfortable? Oh, they're like my family. Uh, okay. In, in a good way. Sometimes in a bad way, those, that, we also need to pay attention to that because that's what we're like. Mm -mm. They're going to get our goat and we need, to, we need to have some boundaries there too. We'll talk more about that in a minute. But the people that are the good kind of crazy, and they're like, come on in, kick off your shoes, and here's a glass of tea, and I was, um, I was recently separated from my partner, was away from my dog, my cat, my kid, my home, my person that I loved, and was on a friend's couch, and was, you know, and finally was moved, at, and when we uh, finally ended the relationship, and I was in my own house, and when I came home, you know, it wasn't, it was autumn, and it wasn't like warm with yummy smells of whatever was cooking on the stove, and the dogs didn't yet know how to turn on the lights and the TV and make it all comfy for me when I came in. And, and so I was going home to a dark, quiet house. And a, a family that wanted me to visit when I was working as a hospice chaplain and grief counselor after hours so that all the adult children could be there and hear what was going on and talk and we could, could process through what was going on. And, and so we agreed that I would do that on occasion to have everyone be able to, be, to, to meet. Um, but I would walk in, and it was loud, and it was crazy, and it smelled good, and there were dogs and kids and cats everywhere, and everybody's laughing and talking, and TV's blaring in the background. And they're like, hey, kick off your shoes. Here's a glass of tea. You want something to eat? Here, let's fix you a plate. And I thankfully had one of my better angels that day was going, you know, uh-uh. No, you don't need to get too comfy here. Because when we start letting ourselves feel like family, we start working our family stuff out on each other. And we lose our objectivity. And we lose our ability to have those hard conversations. And we get caught up into doing the more people pleasing because we don't want them to not like us. And so we don't set the boundaries that we need to. And it can be the start of that slippery slope where things can be difficult. Because it's important to connect with a person but not to get overly attached to their outcome. And so I brought in my own water bottle. And I said, thank you, no, but I have plans afterward. It was to go home to a dark, quiet house where there wasn't any food ready for me to the two border collies. But they didn't need to know that. I had plans after work. And so thank you, no, I have plans for dinner afterward, but thank you. And so I could be friendly. I could be loving. I could be warm. I could be connected. I could start you know, speaking with the same accent that they did because we were from the same parts of the country. And... And, and I kept within me that sense of, and I'm clear, I'm not a part of the family. So there's that, that narrow line that we all get to find. But I knew that more than ever then was a time when it was going to be tempting to fall in to being accepted as a part of their family. But if I had done that, it would have been about meeting my needs and not theirs. So when there are times we know that we're in a bit of a lower place or not as well resourced. Those are the times when, more than ever, we need to pay attention to whose needs are getting met in this care interaction, theirs or mine. So, we connect with them, but not their outcome. We can want them to have a certain outcome, but if I need them to have a certain outcome or to make certain choices, I am setting myself up for disappointment because they will always make different choices. They will always have a different path. Their values are not my values, and if I'm not careful, I will impose my values upon theirs. During the polar uh, vortex, I had a student in Maryland, a, a physician at, a hospital, at uh, Johns Hopkins, who uh, said, came to me and said, I am struggling because we have this gentleman who is homeless. He is on he's transitioning from, from palliative to hospice care. And we have jumped through hoops and managed to get him a place to live and die indoors. Warm, fed, cared for, safe, medicated, symptoms controlled. And he won't do it. He won't come inside. And we have tried everything. We've gotten every person on the team to try to talk to him, to try to talk him into this and convince him. And he just will not budge. And he is just, and we're just all struggling that he just won't. And we're just having such a hard time that he won't. And he's just refusing. And we don't understand why. And I said, well, after all we've done, you know, Marge salute. Been there. <laughs> we've done all these things. And I just listened. And I said, well, it sounds frustrating. It sounds tough. 
Yeah, I hear you. Just validating their feelings. Because you know, when people come to us and they're in lizard brain, what they need is to be aligned with and to have their feelings validated. Now, I didn't validate her story. You're right, I can't believe he didn't. I didn't triangulate, I didn't jump in the middle of it. I didn't agree with her story, but I validated her feelings. And so I didn't try to then start trying to fix her or jump into facts. You go to the feelings first. You tend to the feelings. Well, I hear you. Sounds like you are really frustrated. I hear how much you care for this person. I hear how hard this is for you to see him suffering in a way that seems untenable to you and that you have a solution and that he's not accepting and you don't understand and I hear that it's really hard for y'all. And so listen until she kind of just And felt validated and had her feelings normalized enough that she could come out of the lizard brain into the prefrontal cortex where decision making and executive function happens. And we can think more clearly. And that's when I could start talking about facts. So I'm curious. Which if you've been around clinicians long enough and a health clinician, you want to know as long is she slaying part. Oh, what the hell? Really? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, social workers, I just gave it away. Um, and I said, so I'm curious. I'm hearing y'all's values and what y'all want for his end of life. What does he want and need for his end of life? Who has asked him that and what did he say? Uh, so because working a lot with people without houses, I know that for them, as much as it can be scary and intimidating to be out and free, to come inside can also feel incredibly restrictive and claustrophobic. His coping resources, his family, the ways that he knows to navigate the world are all out on the streets. You're asking him to come inside away from all of that. And so before we assume and put our square peg into their round hole, we get to check with them. What do they want? What do they need? What are their values? I had a chaplain years ago on a professional forum in LinkedIn. Did anybody else have a problem? With patients, this is a hospice chaplain for him. With patients that should be doing this work with the Lord. I'm like, well, there's the first boundary violation right there. <laughs> and when they should have all this quiet space, and instead it's loud, and they have like cops on in the background. And uh, like, uh, anybody else have a problem with that? And how do you go in and make them like get it quiet and still and put on like religious music? And I'm like, oh, where do you start? Okay. <laughs> And essentially, people were trying and trying and trying to talk to him and trying to, and he just, he wasn't really getting it. I finally said, my brother, how do you know that what most speaks to him of comfort and familiarity and home isn't the dogs and the cats running in and jumping over him on top of him on the recliner and the kids banging doors and pots and pans, people yelling. How, how do you know that's not exactly what he needs? To feel connected and safe and good and to have the transition that he needs and wants. Because it may be that the most soothing thing to him is not religious music. That's our assumption about what needs to happen, if anything, for him in his final days and hours and moments. It may be that what he most needs is to hear as he's drifting and transitioning into stepping into the next life, whatever life needs to look like or looks like for him afterwards, if anything. Maybe what he most needs to hear is, bad boys, bad boys. <laughs> <laughs> we make assumptions all the time and we have to get past those assumptions to find out what they want. We come in filled up with our own practices so that we are not looking for the interaction with them to make us feel better about ourselves. We're responsible to them to bring our, to our clinical skills. We are not responsible for them, except in the extreme and rare cases where they are minors without an adult present as a guardian, or unless there's someone who has a court-ordered legal guardianship and has been declared incompetent. Except in those extreme cases, we are responsible to them. We are not responsible for them. And so we constantly ask ourselves these questions. Now, in palliative care, we talk a lot about paternalism because um, we want to be careful to guard this balance. But I take this so seriously that how often do you hear ourselves say, our patients, my clients, 
constantly, right? Well, the brain is so sensitive to language that the brain scans show that at pain clinics, when someone says, oh, my back is killing me, the threat centers in the brain fire up red. Someone's killing us. Alert, alert. Someone's trying to kill us. <laughs> because our brains are so sensitive to language. We teach them instead of that pain behavior to say, well, my back really hurts. And the threat centers fire up yellow. Wait, what? Something's hurting us? We need to pay attention to that. So we can respond, but without freaking the heck out. Because our brains are so sensitive to language, I challenge us to say, instead of our or mine, to say, persons for whom I care, patients with whom I work, clients with whom I care, something along those lines, instead of mine, my patients, our patients. Because I don't want to risk even for a second communicating to their brain or to mine that I own them or their process. I had a little boy in West Texas say, yeah, that's just way too much. Fuzzy, woo, woo, P, C, <laughs> My brother, you don't have to agree with me. <laughs> just to ask you to consider the possibility of a different way. So for the next week, notice how many times you hear us saying, uh, our patients, my clients. And pause and stop and back up and say, Persons for whom I care, clients for whom I care, patients whom I serve. Because I'd rather take an extra second and a half than risk telling anybody that we own them or their process. And when I intentionally change my language, it keeps me mindful of this dynamic and helps me stay on this side of that line. Now, oftentimes when I talk about boundaries, I've had people say, and God bless them, hospice nurses especially, we're like, but we're supposed to connect with people. We're supposed to love on people. You're asking us to like not be connected with people at all. And I'm like, here's the thing. It is hardwired in our DNA to want love and to connection, to see and be seen, to know that there are people who absolutely love us and will always have our backs, who will care for us and be there for us, who think that we are absolutely stinking adorable, to be able to give and receive love. To know that we are part of a tribe, that we have our people, that we have the folks that are always with us. It is hardwired in our DNA to need and want love and connection. There is absolutely nothing wrong with that. There will be clients who we do resemble. There will be patients that we care for who will feel, feel too connected to us. They will remind us of our mama, our daddy, our great aunt, our grandmamas, our partners, ourselves. And we will resonate with them. Countertransference is a thing, and it's not necessarily a bad thing. It means that we're human. The trick is to notice when it happens so that we can catch ourselves and not go tumbling forward into it. I had a patient that I cared for who... Um, Oh, she loved, when I first went to go see her, it was a hospice chapel, went to a skilled nursing facility here in town, and when I went to walk in <laughs> to the doorway, I knocked, because the nurse said she really needs to see a chaplain. I found out later, why? Um, she wanted me to go convert her. I'm like, yeah, that's not what we do. That's, we talk about boundary violations. It's about her beliefs, not mine. And no, mm -mm. Um, But I went, I knocked on the door, and pardon my language, but here's a picture of direct quotes. And she was sitting in the bed, drinking a beer. She had gotten one of the nurses to bring her, eating a piece of pizza, had a cheese, the cheese head, Packer fan, cheese head, foam cheese head up, and, and waving the finger. <laughs> so I had pizza and beer in one hand and foam finger, screaming and cussing you out on the TV, and just having, a, having her own little party watching a Packers game. And when I knocked on the door, at the door, the door frame. She turns and she looks and she says, "Well, who the fuck are you?" <laughs> she was notorious for throwing people out of a room. Most people didn't get in. And I had just a moment, split second, to respond. And I thought this will either be like one of the best things I've ever done, or I'll get to head talk to Jesus later about this. And I said, "I'm your fucking chaplain. I came by to see what I can do." <laughs> <laughs> Some people are praying for me right now, so just want to honor their, I'm going to honor their grief too. Um, and, I, and, I, and I waited. <laughs> and she said, 
you can't talk like that. You're a chaplain. And I'm like, well, you did, and I'm no better than you, so why not? And she stared at me for a long time. And she finally went, huh, I like you. You passed. Get in here and sit down. <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you. She was determined to get in with everyone that she connected with. Her favorite trick was when the young CNAs would come around to take her order for lunch or for drinks. She would say, tell her what she wanted to eat, and she's like, what do you want to drink? Yeah, I want some diet water, please. Diet water? Do you have diet water? I don't, I don't know if we have diet water. I'll have to, let me go check. And she would look at me like, you're evil. You're evil. And she's like, they need, they need to learn how to think. And it's fun. It makes my day. I can control very few things. If I can get off on this, leave me alone. I'm like, yes, ma'am. And so the CNA came back in and she went, funny. <laughs> but she was determined to get in. She resonated with me. She too had been rejected by her very religious family when she was a young adult for being gay. And she too knew what it was like to have the love of their life and to have that situation in tragically and slowly over time, more and more people in her life dying during the AIDS crisis in the early days. So finally she looked up one day and she was alone under a bridge and dehydrated and demented. And when they brought her in and cleaned her up and got her rehydrated and got her medicated, who her personality came out and they called her Queen Elizabeth because she ruled that place. And she was hard not to adore, and she was hard for me not to relate to. Because her story was very close to mine. And where she had been was where I could have gone. And so I reached out to my colleagues and said, this one's going to get me. Went, yeah, we figured, because we had that connection. It happens. But because I knew it happened, I went to others and I said, I need you to watch me. I need you to pay attention, and I need you to help make sure that I don't overstep for her sake and for mine. And so they did, and we navigated it, and I knew that when she died, I was, she wanted me, she wanted me to, uh, to say final sacrament over her when she was dying, and I did. Love her in the whole time. And usually I pulled it together with that one. Nope, I cried like a baby. And so it's not about not being human. It's about noticing when our humanity is putting us at risk of going too far in a way that's hurtful for everyone involved. And putting in protective measures not to stop the caring, to honor it, to give it its space, but to not let it drive the bus. So we ask whose needs are being met. We want to stay in that zone of helpfulness. We don't want to overfunction. We don't want to underfunction. Both of those can be difficult. So let's think about countertransference and ask yourselves and each other these questions. When you notice yourself getting close, you can ask, do I find myself identifying with them? What needs of mine are getting met? Um, whose needs are getting met? There's or mine. What are the emotions that get come up? Do I have a lot of energy stirred up? At an interdisciplinary meeting with uh, a medical team, one of the nurses was venting about, you know, that daughter-in-law in a family who had Googled WebMD and suddenly had all the expertise and was wanting to tell the nurse how things should be done and the physician how things should be done. And as they were, um, as this nurse was dealing with this young woman who'd been kind of designated by the family to be the one freaking out and in control of everything, and the nurse was struggling and she was venting. And we gave space for her to vent, but then there came a point where the venting was like it kept going and kept going and kept going and it was especially charged. And you know those conversations you can have with your eyebrows but you don't actually say any words? The social worker was sitting across the team table from me and was like, oh dear God. I'm like, yeah, I know, what's up? She's like, I don't know, but she's really, this, this daughter has got her and go. Well, what do we need to do? Well, you need to say something. I'm like, I'm not saying something, you're the social worker. You need to handle this. And she's like, no, I'm not doing this. You've got the God card you can hide behind. She won't scream at you, you need to handle it. And so we're having this quiet argument with our eyebrows across the table about what to do and how to respond to this nurse that was all fired up. And so afterwards, we're like, okay, fine, we'll do it together. So we asked the nurse to stay behind because we're all on the same team. And we sat with the nurse and said, so, we're curious. 
there seems to be a lot of energy stirred up around this one. I know it's just, and so she meant it a little longer and we listened. Shh, shh, sounds really frustrating. How can we support you so that all members of the team are on board and we're all there working with this situation so you're not doing it alone? Because that's key. The more hands are on deck, the more dispersed things are, the more healthy it is. When we start working in silos and thinking we're the only ones, that's when we can get into trouble. And so as we listened and as we talked and as she vented and when she finally started to calm down, I said, so I'm really curious, does this feel familiar to you? What? Well, of course it does. We run into family members like this all the time. Yeah, I get that. And there seems to be a lot of energy for you with this one. And I'm curious if it feels familiar to any other aspect of your life, maybe even outside of work. And she went, what? I mean, I mean oh, crap. It's my sister-in-law she reminds me of. And this is exactly what we do. And so we're going to have those moments. We just notice them, we tend to them, and we bring people in around us to support us. And we find safe places to be honest and real where they're not going to throw us under the bus and drive us drive it back and forth over us a few times. Where they're not going to punish our vulnerability by making fun of us or shaming or judging us or working their own shame out on us. We find the safe places where we can be vulnerable and have people acknowledge that and honor it and say, cool, all right, we get that. How very human of you. Thanks for being honest. How can we support you in this? That, those are the kinds of things, places that we need to create. If we find ourselves doing these things, those might be red flags for us to pay attention to. Now, how about this? How many of you struggle when you see someone who is suffering, who is younger than you? Okay. All right, what about for those, uh, what if it's someone who's older than you? What if it, is it hardest for you when someone is similar to you? What about if someone is similar to your loved ones? Yeah, that often really gets us. Or someone who seems helpless and alone. Yeah, that can get us too, because we make up stories. Oh, it's just so horrible. The famous family never comes to see him. He's just there. He's just the sweetest, kindest, nicest man. We don't know. We weren't raised by him. He could be, but no person's one thing. He may have been in the midst of his brokenness. Ooh, been hell on wheels to be, to be raised by. And they still yell at them behind closed doors when we're not with them. We're seeing the older, oftentimes, or the weakened, and sometimes we're a bit demented or other, otherwise cognitively altered. We're seeing the public best foot forward face of people. And that doesn't mean that we disparage that. Again, people get to be not just one thing. But we don't want to tell ourselves a story and get this whole story going of them, the poor, helpless victim, and everyone else, the bad guy, because that also gets us hooked into a dynamic that may or may not be true. So often my mentor will say, no, 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 no good guys, no bad guys, just two people trying to find their way. We keep the, the, love, the, play, the playing field level. So we just notice these things about ourselves so that when we find ourselves getting hooked, that's when we can step in and do something differently. Because we think we often have to carry things for other people, but we don't and we can't. Megan Devine's a grief author, and she says, sometimes some things in life cannot be fixed, they can only be carried. And while they carry them, we can just show up and walk alongside them so that they don't have to be alone while they do. So we get really clear about our stories, the stories that we want to tell ourselves. Don Miguel Ruiz in The Four Agreements, one of them is to be impeccable with your word, but he says it's also about the, be impeccable with your words, not just what we say to others. But it's also about being impeccable with the words that we say to ourselves. So notice the stories that you start to tell yourself. Notice when you start to set someone up as being the helpless victim. They may or may not be, because often, in some cases, certainly people are victimized. But very, very often, we humans, millimeter on millimeter, decision by decision, indecision by indecision, co-create our lives. We make choices along the way. And so we get to acknowledge that sometimes where people are is part of what they have co-created in their lives, for good or for ill. But when we automatically assume that everyone else is the, is the villain, they are the victim, then we can get into over-functioning and over-caring for them. And let's be honest, there are some of us who have been trained over time that the best skills, the best coping skills, are to play the victim, to get everyone else feeling sorry for them, to not have boundaries with them, and over-function and to take care of them. You've seen that. So we just want to be constantly be mindful. Just because sometimes 
People may be powerless to change the people or circumstances around them, but they are not helpless to take action on their own behalf. And we want to empower and equip them to do so as much as possible. So we trust their journey, trust the process. And remember, when we start telling ourselves stories, there was a farmer who got a horse. And all the people in the village went, oh my goodness, how fortunate, how lucky. You got this horse to help you on the farm. And he said, mm, maybe it is, maybe it isn't lucky. And then his only son was riding the horse around the farm to help him and fell off the horse and broke his leg. And the villagers went, oh, how unfortunate, how unlucky. This only son to help you on the farm fell off this horse that you got and broke his leg and now can't help you. How unfortunate, how unlucky. And the farmer said, maybe it is, maybe it isn't. And then the army came through and conscripted all the able-bodied young men in the village into the war where they most certainly would fight and die and not come home again. And the villagers said, oh, how fortunate, oh, how lucky this only son of yours had this broken leg and wasn't able to be taken into the army where he was going to most likely die. How fortunate, how lucky. And the farmer said, maybe it is, maybe it isn't. We don't know. We tell ourselves stories all the time that may or may not be true. And so when we're looking upon someone else's story, sometimes the things that I thought were going to be the worst ever turned out to have the most gifts. And sometimes the things that I thought were like, I've won the lottery, turned out to be, oh my gosh. So when we start telling ourselves a story about someone else's journey, we stop and we back up and we check out that story. Because it may be our own story getting imposed upon them, or it may be some other thing that's hooking us. And so what is it that gets you hooked into getting over functioning in someone's story? Or has you averse to someone else's story because... You're not liking. You're not liking something in them that most likely reminds you of something in someone else or something inside of you that you don't like. The same defense mechanisms that I'll use against me are the same defense mechanisms that I'll use to distance myself from others and others' pain. Bless you. So we get to think about suffering and hope. What is our belief system about why suffering happens? What, how do we answer this idea? Because when we have a why, we can make it through almost anything. We have some sort of sense of meaning, some sense of there is some purpose that I can find in this. I don't believe in a deity who causes or prevents bad or good. I believe in a deity who shows up and goes, well, I don't, this is so not what I wanted. How can I help bring as much good out of this as possible? And that's just my belief system. It doesn't need to be yours. But for me, that helps me in when I see suffering. And how can we work to bring as much good as possible out of the situation? Of trusting that people will find their way. When um, one of my mentor looked at me during one of the hardest times of my life, and she said, you know, when you're stressed, she would say, you know, I hear you. As I was just, you know, talking about a really troubling thing, and she would say, I hear you. I hear you. I hear you. And finally one day she said, you know, when you are struggling and I don't go, oh, I'm so sorry. It doesn't mean that I don't care. When I say I hear you, that's me saying I care. But I believe that you are powerless over the people and circumstances here, but you're not helpless to take action on your own behalf. You, these are all the things that are seemingly negative, and yet there are other things. You have people around you who love you and always have your back. She's my spiritual director. She can say, you have a God who loves you and has a greater imagination than you do. You are strong and you are capable. Because I believe in trusting you, I believe that you will be stronger on the other side of this and that you will find your way. Even if it's not easy and perfect, that you will be better on the other side of this rather than worse. And because I believe in you, because I trust in you, how could I ever be sorry for you to have that experience? And I was like, uh, thanks, I think. But it was the most affirming, confidence boost. Her faith in me. To be better on the other side rather than worse. You know when someone comes to you when you're having a tough time. Like, oh, I'm so sorry. And it's to the point where it feels pathetic. It feels condescending. Instead, it was this empowering kind of, you've got this. Renee Brown cites the work of C.R. Snyder, a psychologist in whose entire research was in on, uh, the episode, uh, on, um, on hope. And he says, we think that hope is an emotion feeling, but it's not. It's a cognitive behavioral construct that we develop when we face challenging circumstances, have people around us, like us, who believe in our ability to find our way through, and then once we have found our way through, then we have built hope, 
confidence, if you will, that the next time we face a challenge in circumstance that we'll be able to handle it because we have the lived experience that we already have. We don't need to give people hope. We don't need to make it all better for them. We don't need to give them hope. We can't. And we don't have to. We show up and we say, I believe in your ability to find your way through. And while you do, you're not alone. We're with you. When we need to give people hope, we need to make it all better. We don't want to have the hard conversations. We sugarcoat the truth. My best friends in Ohio are now in North Carolina where their dad just got hit, uh, a cancer diagnosis. Uh, Carol's dad just got a cancer diagnosis recently, received chemo last Monday a week ago, felt great on Tuesday, got called to come back into the doctor's office for an emergency visit on Wednesday, where the doctor said, we're really sorry, we never really should have given you, given you chemo, because this is like the worst pet, pet scans we've ever seen, you probably have like days to weeks, and he died two days later. And the family had been given this false hope because the doctor did not want to dash their hope, and so it wasn't honest with them and so instead of having the information and being able to hurt now and grieve now and prepare their hopes got way up here because oh man the chemo's working he's feeling better and then to have this whew, talk about messing with your heart they're messed up right now they're struggling and so we don't want to do that to people because we don't need to give them hope we show up and say here's the truth here's the reality and we believe in your ability to find your way through and while you do you're not alone we're with you. And you can empower and bolster them in ways that can be helpful for them and leave you from getting overly hooked. And so why do you believe suffering happens? Where do you believe that goodness is or deity is or whatever is when people are struggling? What, how do you find hope in the midst of challenges? Find that for yourself. Not to tell them, because even as a chaplain, I do not tell people. I'm not prescriptive. I don't give them the answers. I don't speed, spoon, try to put spoon feed my my source of meaning, my ways of understanding the world, all the cliches, trying to spoon feed those to people that are struggling, those are the cheap seats. Sitting them with it while they wrestle with the struggle of suffering and find their own, hell of a lot harder, but so much more impactful. <laughs> One of my favorite readings, and we're talking about boundaries and presence is this. It's by Lao Tzu from the Tao of Leadership in the 7th century BCE. He says, and I am search for leader, I am search caregiver. says, the wise leader does not intervene unnecessarily. The leader's presence is felt, but often the group runs itself. Lesser leaders do a lot, say a lot, have followers, and form cults. Even worse ones use fear to energize the group and force to overcome resistance. Only the most dreadful leaders have bad reputations. Remember that you are facilitating another person's process. It is not your process. Do not intrude. Do not control. Do not force your own needs and insights into the background. If you do not trust a person's process, that person will not trust you. Imagine that you are a midwife, you're assistant at someone else's birth, do good without show or fuss, facilitate what is happening rather than what you think ought to be happening. If you must take the lead, lead so that the mother is helped to get still free and in charge. When the baby is born, the mother will rightly say, we did it ourselves. That's the type of ego strength that we want to build in them. That's the type of empowerment we want to help people find. That is what can give us the compassion and satisfaction that lets us know that we know that we know that we've made a connection, we've made a difference. But in a way that doesn't ask too much of us or take too much away from them. So there are some protective measures and some warning signs I'm going to go through quickly. I won't read through all of these. I'll trust you to read them later and to take them to your team. I believe these uh, slides will be available uh, later on as a handout. So yes, we can see us saying yes. So take a look at these. Keep them with your group. Try to find ways to, because some people are like, well, I've got these boundaries, but there's this person I work with. And so we show up to be the change. We can't change them. We show up 
and we are the difference. And enough of us show up to do things differently and others can't help but change. Or they won't like us and they'll invite us to go work someplace else. But we show up being that difference. And if we do it enough, then eventually other people will have to change. They won't be able to continue working in dysfunctional ways. But we don't want to show up in a way We don't want to keep showing up in a way that undervalues even our colleagues' importance and overvalues our own, because that's where, again, we get to some members of the team over-functioning and others under-functioning, and that's not healthy for anyone. So we don't want to create, when we over-function, okay, the only way to get us to stop over-functioning and being codependent is to tap into our codependence, then I'll use it. So imagine this, when we over-function in someone else's life, then we invite them to get angry with our colleagues if our colleagues don't also overfunction. Well, why won't you give me your home phone number? So and so does. What do you mean I have to call on call and I can't call you directly? That's not what so and so does. And so it's important for us. Now, how often do we want to point the finger and have the identified patient on our team who's the problem? Get ready, take a big deep breath. And we neglect our own complicity because we've been quiet. What we permit, we perpetuate. So it's not just the one person who's acting in a dysfunctional way. If they were in a healthy, functional system, that behavior would not persist. When we get a splinter, our body either absorbs it or pushes it out. When we have a source of dysfunction in a system, in an organization, we can't say that one person is the problem because we are creating the perfect petri dish of silence or fawning to protect ourselves from them being mad at us. We are acting in ways that are actually enabling and emboldening their behavior. So unless we're actively working in a healthier, positive way to say, I need to name, I have a concern that if all of us aren't equally working, then there's a problem. We can start by gently setting those boundaries. We can gently set boundaries about gossip instead of, we, we can say, you know, I'm really curious, what did so-and-so say when you told them how bad they were with you? What? I didn't, I haven't. I'll be curious to hear what they say when you talk to them about how upset you are with them. We can artfully have boundaries. It don't have to be about huge confrontations, but if we're not doing it, we are just as complicit as the people are that we're pointing fingers at that are causing problems with our organization. Yeah, it usually gets really, really, really quiet when I start talking this way. Um, because it's hard for me too to acknowledge that. So we pay attention to red, red flags, we pay attention to isolation, we pay attention to these warning signs. So when we see those in ourselves and when we see them in each other. Now if people feel heard and listened to, respected and valued and that their feelings are validated and normalized, then once they feel not under threat, it will be, and you say, wow, of course I hear how much you care about them. When we feel good about ourselves, it's easier for us to take in information and to be challenged. And so the most loving and caring thing we can do, and the most um, act, the greatest act of, acts of integrity we can do on a team, is to hold one another accountable. Now it's not about call out culture, it's about calling people forth. There is a difference. Calling people out is about gotcha, catching them, you're wrong and bad, it's about shame. Calling people forth is inviting people to be their better selves. And also holding a boundary that says, and that's not the way that we talk here. I hear we're frustrated, and that's not the way that we're going to engage here. You can do it very gently, very artfully, very diplomatically, very caringly, but it's also very fierce. I said that your kindness is not mistaken for weakness. Having boundaries is not just about having them for ourselves, it's about having them with others. And the more clear we are, the more clear we are with our own boundaries. For instance, I need to name, I have just enough ADHD that when there's side conversations and mumbling going on, my ears get distracted. And so I apologize, but if the talking could, could cease, and my, my little ADHD brain struggles with that and I get really distracted from where I am. Thank you. So, so read, through these, read through these warning signs. Pay attention to them for yourselves and for your teams. And when you see someone that's having a struggle with these, create a culture where you can go and talk with them and say, Hey, I'm noticing that. Hey, I'm curious about. Hey, can we talk about this? How can we as a team best support you? Because it seems like this person, this care situation is a struggle for you. 
Now, um, this is from the ring theory from the LA Times, a couple of clinicians, when she went through cancer and he um, was walking through that journey with her, they were able to see how people worked all their stuff out on them. And everyone came in and wanted to share their own stories. And they're like, we don't have enough, we're, we're consumed with our own, we don't have enough room for anybody else's. And everyone wanted to come with unsolicited advice because suddenly I had a cancer scare in 2012 if I had one more person come to me and suggest a green wheatgrass spiraliness smoothie. <laughs> I was gonna punch him in the throat, no I'm a pacifist. I'm just worth theirs, but still. I was gonna hurt somebody, slap them naked and burn their clothes, whatever you wanna call it, but. Um, and that unsolicited advice, I had, eight, I had eight new specialists overnight. I had enough to deal with the, with their recommendations. I didn't have room for anyone else's. But it's what we do because we need life to not be capricious. We need it to be controllable and manageable. And so what we need to do is we need to say, if you would just have this green wheatgrass spirit in a smoothie, you would be fine. Because I need to believe that if I got cancer, because seeing you have, have a cancer scare is scaring me, that I might be vulnerable to cancer too. And so I need to believe that it's controllable and manageable. So I need to believe that if I had a cancer scare, that I could just drink a green wheatgrass spirit in a smoothie and that'd be fine. That's what we're doing when we do that with each other. We're trying to manage our anxieties, but we're working that on other people. And so we get to pay attention to what we say and how we are present with others and their suffering. And so they came up with this really simple diagram that the aggrieved or the afflicted is right in the middle of the circle because everything really does revolve around them. The next circle out are their immediate family. The next circle out are their true friends and then their colleagues and acquaintances and looky loose. If you need to process your own, I can't believe he's going through that. I can't, but I mean, he has those two young kids and I just, man, that's just so, such a nice part. I just can't believe. If we need to process our own grief, we dump that stuff to someone else, or this reminds me of the time when, dump that stuff to someone further out of the circle than you are. If you speak to someone who's closer in towards the center of the circle, you speak only words of comfort. Another way of holding those boundaries and helping families know how to hold boundaries with others and validating for them that they're allowed to set those boundaries. So when we come in and we aren't full, then we need something from the care situation rather than just want it. We over-function and then we isolate and then we get resentful and we get tired and overwhelmed. Why is nobody else caring as much as I do? Why is no one else working as hard as I am? And then we burn out and we underfunction, and then we aren't full and then the cycle starts all over because often what we don't do is go, you know, I'm feeling overwhelmed. Maybe I should take some time away. Instead, we think if I just work harder and if I just work more late nights catching up on paperwork, then I will get ahead and I will feel better and I'll be okay. It never works that way. We know that. And so learn what are the canaries in the coal mine that communicate to you that you're crispy. The coal miners didn't go walk past and go, look at that, the canary's dead on the bottom of the cage, huh? And keep on working further into the mine where they did have either not enough oxygen or it hit a, a gas leak. No, they got the heck out of there. So how often do we know what I, do we see or miss seeing our canaries in the coal mine and just keep and just ignore them and go, shh, and we just keep on walking further into the mine especially right now. And so how do we offload the ones that do get in? We can get caught up in FOMO. We can get caught up in feeling like we can't step away and we can't stop. I've already talked about this a little bit, but how we get to imagine that there are other people that can step in. Out of the 7.8 million people on the planet, there is someone else who can step in. But we don't have to be there all the time for everyone. Now, we know that the prevalence of trauma in the general population is about 83.7%. That's from a representative sample across the U.S. from 0 to 99 years of age, about 82.3% roughly. Or excuse me, 82.7% of things, the most recent stats. Now, if you think about those of us who come from a dysfunctional family background and have our own histories of trauma, we are disproportionately drawn to two professions. Law enforcement, because we want to go catch the bad people, and protect the innocents and professional caregiving because we were raised as the hero children we were raised as the caregivers we were raised as the ones to be sensitive to everyone else's feelings to know to notice the energy in the room and to respond to it 
We're the ones that were raised to be the perfectionists, the heroes, the good kids. We were raised to be that, and it can give us some of our best superhero skills as caregivers. It's not bad in and of itself. Until it is. Because if my wanting to overachieve becomes so driven that I'm driving over others, I'm stepping over boundaries, and or I'm wearing myself out, or if I'm wanting to do a good job and wanting to do well, these things be so perfectionistic that I'm driven constantly by people pleasing, driven by having to get it right, driven to be so perfect that I'm critical and harsh and judgmental of myself, and we think that we're just critical and harsh and judgmental of ourselves, but we're not. It doesn't exist in a vacuum. It ekes out sideways at others too. And or they hear us and they're like, well, she's that harsh with herself. How badly is she judging me? We invite other people to be just as harsh and critical of themselves too. So it doesn't just hurt us. Check out Kristen Neff, her selfcompassion.org. Um, amazing site. And you can take the self-compassion skill. Self-compassion.org, Kristen Neff, uh, from UT Austin's where she did her doctoral work. And you can take the self-compassion scale and check in to see how well you are doing. And so if you think, you know, 82.7% of the population has their own history of trauma, people are disproportionately drawn to professional caregiving from their own histories of trauma. That means that the prevalence of trauma within professional caregivers is more like in the 95 to 97%. So what can be our greatest strength as caregivers can be our biggest Achilles heel and can take us out. How many times have, times have you heard someone say, oh, well, I'm an empath. You're like, no, baby girl, you're hypervigilant. <laughs> There's a difference. <laughs> Same continuum. Over here, it's hypervigilance. I must know what everyone else is thinking and feeling so that I can dodge and bother and weave just right to keep myself safe. Versus empathy of not from a place of anxiety, but from groundedness and assurance and a sense of safety and confidence in myself. I can pay attention to and attune to what's going on in the room and to notice and adapt as needed to provide as safe and healing of the rotten environment as needed. Same skills from a very different place. So, we get to pay attention to, I was speaking in Montana and afterwards, after speaking about this, I had a nurse come up and she said, um, I'm flying to the Children's National Healthcare System in DC tomorrow and on Friday we're doing, we're on our fourth cohort of teaching all the clinicians at Children's National Hospital and through the Children's National Healthcare System in DC mindfulness techniques. <coughs> and they're doing them at the bedside and it's become such a huge part of their culture, they're changing their medical records to be able to document when they're using mindfulness interventions at the bedside. We're teaching them to them to practice for themselves, and then they practice for themselves so much that then we teach them how to teach them at the bedside. Because we first get to do it for ourselves and embody what we're trying to teach and provide for others, and then we show up as the best teaching tool ever because we're embodying it, and we're showing them what it's like. And so that when we take a big deep breath of, it invites them to also. And so we practice these techniques because we'll talk more about this in a second. But afterwards, when I was when I was talking about this, um, teaching this in Montana, and a nurse came up and she said that she used to work at Children's back before Children's was making this turn and realizing how much they were wearing themselves and each other out because it takes a graduating class, one to two average size graduating classes of med students to replace the number of physicians who commit suicide every year. That's been going on since the late 2000s. We've been killing ourselves trying to take care of each other for far too long. When healthcare and professional caregiving became less of a calling and a philosophy and a mission and started shifted to be more of a business, which is not bad in and of itself because we need to be sustainable, so we need good business. But when it became much more of a business and when too many of us from our own dysfunctional backgrounds, instead of coming from a place as healed healers, but instead we're wounded healers and we're toxic and let people take advantage of us so that the employee of the year and the volunteer of the year are the people who we call self-sacrificing, going above and beyond. That's toxic. It's toxic. So the shit show dumpster fire that we're going through right now that's wearing us out 
For me, the post-traumatic growth in it, the resilient bit of the opportunity and the challenge and the, the invitation to us is to say, we're not doing this shit anymore. Not like this. We're going to transform the way we individually do professional caregiving from that healthy end rather than that, from that toxic end. And together, we will revolutionize the way that healthcare is done. The great resignation that happened in August and then again in September, you want to know the number one professions? Healthcare, specifically nurses, but all of healthcare. I talk with some of you in the break who are like, I'm getting out of this business, I can't do this anymore. I'm worn out. We're sitting back here crying when you tell these stories because you're talking about our story. We can't do this anymore. We can't and we shouldn't and we don't have to and we don't need to because if enough of us show up in a healthy, functional way and say, we're gonna do good business, but while keeping our hearts and being healthy, and we're gonna be healthy ourselves by saying, self-care needs to be a part of our annual performance reviews. How well we hold healthy boundaries while performing well is gonna go on those nomination forms for employee volunteer of the year. How well we do work-life balance is gonna become a part of our employee review. It's going to be a part of our regular meetings. We're going to see it as we're going to have our systems kick up a red flag when someone has too many PTO hours accrued that they're not taking time off. We are going to require that we do professional caregiving in a healthier and more positive way because we can't do it like this anymore. And she said, when I was working at Children's, 12 of us nurses were sitting around in between meetings talking and we're talking about this, you know, we're talking about the schedule. And one of them said, oh, I know we need, to, we need someone to fill that shift. You know I'm going to wind up taking it. I'm codependent enough. I came from an alcoholic family background. I'm going to wind up taking it. You know I am. And one of the other nurses said, you came from an alcoholic family too? Yeah, you. And one by one, all 12 nurses sitting around that table admitted to coming from a background where there was significant struggles and brokenness in the family, primarily alcoholism and addiction, which we know is not the cause of, but is caused by trauma, right? And they looked at each other and went, this can't be a coincidence. We have an opportunity, my friends, to find a different way to do this, a better way to do this that's better for the people we care for and better for us. We've got to stop killing ourselves while trying to save others. We help them when we do. And so we find rituals. We find ways to do things. So the biggest barriers I hear to self-care are time, energy, and money. I was at a conference, though, once where someone said back in law, old school, paper time, not, not uh, online stuff. And he said, I want you to write down your top five most important things to you. What are the things that are most important to you? Write those down, those top five. And then he said, now, I want to give us time for that. So now I want you to write down, I want you to show me your uh, paper, your um, calendar, and your bank statements. Your checkbook, basically, your checkbook register. And I will show you what is most important to you. Because I'll show you where you spend your resources of time, energy, and money, and I guarantee you, your lists are not going to line up. When people say that time, energy, and money are the barriers to self-care, I get it to an extent because it's exhausting to slow down long enough, especially during like, you know, a pandemic, during times of crisis, when the caseloads are high and the need is tremendous. And you know when you take off, you leaving, you're leaving your colleagues to take even more of a hit because you're already understaffed. How could I take time away and go enjoy, I don't know, that hiking and mountain biking in Colorado when I'm leaving my my team behind to face this stuff even more short-staffed. But what good am I if I'm crispy and I'm here? I'm more of a drag than a help, and I eventually will not be able to keep doing this. And so we find ways to step away and take turns. But how do we find the time to, how do we find the time to go to our closet, dig out our yoga pants from where they were in the pile of things that need to be mended. Because the last time we did Downward Dog, we split open the inseam. And did we get those redone? Could I fit in my yoga pants? Could I do Downward Dog? And to find a yoga class that fits our schedule and find the money to pay for it and to actually go to it. I, I get that the barrier of time, energy, and money is important, but I lovingly call bullshit when we say that that's what stops us from doing self-care. I think it's that we don't think that we're worth it. Remember the previous slides about our dysfunction? 
We don't think that we're worth it because we got trained that we were to notice everyone else's feelings, take care of everyone else, but ignore our own needs. And so the longer we continue to do that, the more we contribute to the dysfunction. But when we change that and say, doing self-care isn't selfish. When I do something for me at your expense, that's selfish. But when I take care of me so that I can show up well for you, that's called self-care and there's nothing selfish about it. And so instead of, so fine, if you think time, energy, and money are the things that hold us back from doing self-care, I now talk about self-care. It's not about being bubble baths and, and lavender lotion and massages, although I'm a fan of massage. Bubble baths are nice too. But I talk about self-care as being more about mindfulness. Mindfulness practices. Four, seven, eight breathing while sitting in a stoplight. Heck, on the toilet. While doing paperwork, in a meeting, just make sure you don't look like you're going <sighs> inside <laughs> in an aggrieved way. People won't like that. A magic doorway. Imagine if we're going through doorways all day long. How about we take the things that we're already doing? We're already breathing, we're already walking, we're already going through doorways. Let's do them more in mindfully, more intentionally. Mindfulness from John Kevin Zen is that paying attention, that moment to moment awareness, paying attention on purpose, and here's the key without judgment. And so when we walk through a doorway, let's imagine that there's a waterfall coming down through that doorway, washing the negative energy of the day off of us that's accumulated so far. So that when we walk into the next, that next meeting, that next care interaction, or even the next Zoom room, we imagine that waterfall washing things off of us and clearing the energy of the person who cut us off in traffic, the argument with the two-year-old or our spouse before we left the house. The last care interaction was hard for us. We wash all that off of us so that we go into that interaction clean. And then we do our due diligence, we do our coordination of care, we do our documentation, whatever. And then when we leave that, we trust them, trust that interaction, that meeting, that person, into bigger hands than ours, the universe, their own, the other team, the other members of the team, whatever. And we let, we walk back through out that doorway and we let that doorway wash the negative energy off of us then. So that then we, all day long, we go into that next interaction clean, and all day long, we're washing, we're washing, we're washing, rather than the packing, 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 creeping, creeping, creeping up to our lobes, because we do brace and carry the world on our shoulders. And so we walk through that door. If that's too fuzzy, we will pretend it's a Star Trek ion cannon, sucking all the negative energy off of you. But make a ritual of walking, doing things we're already doing. No extra time, no extra energy, no extra money, just some mindfulness in the moment and get us back into our bodies. Badge ritual, when we put on our badge, when we take off our badge, we do our, do, do our coordination of care, we do our venting of our happy hour, we do whatever we need to do, but when we finally take off our badge, we put it down someplace consistent and special and we make a commitment to ourselves and our loved ones to really, really, really be off work. To not pick up text, to not pick up emails, to not just check on that one patient. Unless we're on call, uh-uh. And even if we are on call, we take the numbers that are allowed to call us when we're on call, and we put them in as favorites that can ring through, do not disturb. But all the rest of the notifications from work, because otherwise, all night long, ding, ding, ding. We have to find some ways to set some boundaries around us. So we put down people, paperwork, and politics. And we're really, 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 really off duty. And if you're a leader and you just can't stop yourself from sending that email at 11 o'clock at night, put it in draft form. Or if I'm a five-year-old to teach you how to schedule it to go out the next morning. <laughs> because if we send it, even if we tell them not to read it, they're not going to be the only one not responding to mom. Because then you may not like us. You'll like all the other kids better and we'll not be safe. Remember, we're going to run around a bunch of traumatized kids from, from traumatic family backgrounds. We would need to know that we're safe. And so set those boundaries, model those boundaries, and require them so that we're really, really, really off work. And then when we put the badge back on, now I'm back on duty, even if we're working remotely from home. When we're washing our hands in healthcare, all right, hospice folks, if your manager's in here, you're about to get some services if you don't answer this correctly. How many seconds do we wash our hands? 20. 20. So usually we sing like Happy Birthday twice, or we sing Row, Row Your Boat, or we sing the Amy Alphabet song. What if instead we took that 20 seconds, or even the 10 seconds, because we're waiting for the alcohol to dry, 
And instead of singing an alphabet song, what if instead we did a breathing technique? What if instead we found our feet and felt them on the floor? Feel your butt in the chair even right now. Relaxing the belly that we suck in all day because we hold our tension here or we want to protect our vital organs or because we're trying to hide our muffin top and pretend that people don't see it. And we really open up our bellies and we breathe like babies teach us to breathe, where they really extend the belly. Because we haven't gotten a hold of them and taught them to be concerned about the muffin top coming over the top of their, di their, their diapers. <laughs> so they're our best teachers for natural breathing. They fill up that big diaphragm. And then they, then they fill up the chest, fill up the belly first, then the chest. Then the chest goes down and the belly goes down. That big natural breathing. We lower our shoulders down away from our earlobes when they creep. And if you think that you've lowered them down, lower them another half an inch. I guarantee you can. We brace so much, they stay there all the time. Take that 20 seconds to breathe, to find your butt, to find your feet. Uh, Anne Lamont says, I want my brain, uh, I want my uh, my brain to be where my butt is. And I've changed that to say I want my brain, my breath, and my butt in the same place at the same time. And if they're not, there's a problem. <laughs> and so brain, breath, butt. Let me get myself off. Have I eaten recently? Have I had anything to drink recently? Have I peed recently? Have I not peed because I don't feel like I have time to stop and go pee? And so I need to drink something, and I need to, so you just check in with your body. Working with people in program and treatment centers, halt, hungry, angry, lonely, tired. For any one of those four things, people know that are working in program, that they are much more, much more less, much less resourced and much more likely to relapse into whatever it is that they're trying to avoid. Hungry, angry, lonely, tired means halt, and you tend to it immediately. We do have time. We can't afford to not take time. So, find rituals to do that can help you offload. Find mindfulness practices. There are tons of them. Guided, and it can just find, find little simple rituals all day long, things that you're doing. Do develop a gratitude practice that again, you can do while driving to work. Turn off talk radio and do a gratitude list. An old boy at a treatment center where I used to work in East Texas was like, yeah, well, I most need to practice gratitude, which is also not a feeling, it's a practice. I practice gratitude to feel grateful. So it's a discipline. And he's like, when I most need to practice gratitude is when I feel the least grateful and the most pissy. And so I can't think of anything that I'm grateful for, so I gotta go through the alphabet. All right, fine. When I'm grateful for, I start with A. Apples. B, bananas, C. Probably shouldn't say carrots, that's cheating these and bananas. All right, fine, cats, cats are cool. D. My dog's kinda nice. And by the time you get to X, Y, and Z, you know, Xanax, yellow zipper. Um, do it the next time you have a team meeting, at the beginning of the team meeting for a century. We're going to practice gratitude together. Let's go through the alphabet. Name one thing for every letter of the alphabet that you're grateful for. What are you grateful for? Start with A. Go. Cool. Our bark's neat. Yep. Adam's also kind of cool. What about B? Bottles of wine. I'm with you. Yep. B. Um, yep. That's also pretty cool. Yep. Brownies. Brownies are nice. C. And 90 seconds, two minutes, you'll talk, you'll laugh, it'll be endearing, you're practicing gratitude together. Because we get so stuck in the negative story, our brains are more hardwired to see the negative. It's called the Zygarnik effect. It's adaptive. Because we need to see where the fence is knocked down, because that's where the saber tooth tiger is going to come in and eat us. So we're, our brains are more hardwired toward war than they are to love. So we have to intentionally practice gratitude. And so we find ways to also remember the things that we good. Not to ignore what's down here, but both emotional intelligence is about both and. It's about seeing that both get to be true, and neither one negates the other. That's why I've been trying to work on the physician burnout that I talked about that was leading them to commit suicide. Duke came up with the three good things practice. For 14 days, not more, not less, once or twice a year, for 14 days, about 10 to 20 minutes before bedtime, they had people write down three good things that happened that day. And here's the most important part. What was their part in those three good things happening? So that at night while they slept, they worked more deeply in their subconscious. For 14 days to train, retrain our brains, to reset our brains, to recalibrate our brains, to also see the positive and to not just stay stuck down here. So when you hear people grousing, you can listen, you can listen, you can listen. Shh. Validate, normalize the feelings. And then when you hear their voice come back down an octave from where it was up in the rafters, and they slow down and they're breathing a little more normally, and they feel validated and heard, then you can go to the facts and say, yeah, these things are true, but what's the rest of the story? Let's tell ourselves the rest of the story. And when my mentor did that, I'm like, what do you mean? For months, what do you mean the rest of the story? That's what she said, the rest of the story is. You have people who love you and always have your back. 
You are capable and you're competent. You can ask for what you need. You can check out the stories that you're telling yourself for good and for ill. You can ask for support. You can set boundaries. You can show up in a way that is more, uh, more uh, functional rather than dysfunctional in this process. And so we finish the stories. And so we can practice gratitude. So that find practices that, why with me on Friday, let's go to Chile, I'll go to DC, and we'll talk about ways to, to do more mindfulness practices, but that is something that doesn't require extra time, energy, and money, work them in throughout our day. We can simply practice presence with another without needing to overstep, because again, presence, attunement, connection is in and of itself healing. We think about interpersonal neurobiology, and Dan Siegel, and Bonnie Bagenbach, and others. We learn ways to sit in silence, to just be present with them. I'm going to skip ahead a few things because some of these I've already actually talked about. So I'm going to skip ahead to say this. Um, I will talk about, actually, you can check out, go to CompassionFatigue.org and you can take self-tests to see where you are on Compassion Fatigue. And also on Compassion Satisfaction. Because Compassion Satisfaction is the antidote and the antithesis of Compassion Fatigue. So every now and then, check in with your team and have them do an alternative centering, where they say, have one person who spends three minutes saying, this is why I got into this field, and this is why I stay. Because when we remind ourselves of the thing, of the moments when we, uh, Ken Parkman, out of Bowling Green, psychologist, he did the research on this, and he says, it's those sacred moments, those not religious, but those moments when you know that you know that you know that you've made a difference. That that is what allows trauma therapists to hear trauma story after trauma story after trauma story and keep going because we're reminded of we made a difference. We can't change their trauma, but we know that we've made a difference. And that helps keep us going in a healthy way. It keeps us fed. It keeps us fulfilled, right? So, um, so we've talked enough about this. I want to get into doing this. Um, oh, I use this for self-care. Okay, we was wrong about you getting a hobby, we need to find you and you work out. <laughs> So I used to say whatever healthcare, whatever I used to say I wanted to see the person who knit that sweater. I've now met them, two of them, both young nurses, one in Montana, one in Florida. And so now I say I want to be the person who put the cat into right. that sweater. <laughs> <laughs> whatever self-care looks like for you, do it. But find ways to more artfully and mindfully incorporate things into things that you're already doing so that it doesn't take extra time, energy, and money. And you do a mindfulness technique for 10 seconds here for 20 seconds there, for two minutes while driving here, while in the bathroom or in this meeting here. You can do a body scan awareness while in the meeting and still be present in the tomb, but be checking out, checking in with your body and be really present with your body. Tons of things that you can just find online that you can incorporate into what you're already doing. You do enough of those throughout the day, and then more often than not, you'll be more embodied and more mindful and happier and healthier and more solid for the people that you're caring for because that's what they deserve. So let's take a second to do this. Um, turn and turn and have a partner next uh, across from you, please. And so we may need to move around tables just a little bit. And so check in with your partner as if you're across from each other. If you want to mask up or not, I'll trust you to make that decision with yourselves. But have nothing in between you, so there just needs to be two people. So if someone is missing a partner, we need to find we need to find you a partner. Who, where's, the, where's an extra person? Where's another extra person that needs partner? Oh, we got everybody partnered up. Okay, so here's, here's the task. We're going to take two minutes maintaining eye contact in silence. Three, two, uh-huh, I said it. One, go.
safety and connection which more easily than lets the people that you're looking at and looking with be able to go it is what we both most crave and most scares the snot out of us to be seen will they see the glitter hanging on out of my nose the gunk in my eyes Will they see into my soul and know how much I don't like myself? Or will they notice all my foibles that I hide from everyone else? Will they see behind the mask that I hold up the Facebook perfect image? Will they see that hair that I didn't get full of today to put my tweezers? You know. And so being really, really, really seen can be incredibly intimidating, especially if there's a trauma in the background. So that attunement. Because some of us learned that attunement was not safe. Hiding was what was safe. Behind all sorts of things that we hide behind. So when we think about attachment and that spectrum from, so from secure or insecurity to avoidant, dismissive, mm -mm, don't need anybody, don't look at me, don't want it, mm -mm, thanks, but no, I'm good going to push it away and sabotage it. Or the insecure, on the other end of the spectrum, they're all insecure. But outside of it, out of, they're either secure or insecure, but all the insecure can look like different things. But the insecure of, if I don't clean, if I don't constantly have attention or connection, you're going to leave me, you're not going to like me, and you constantly stay. And so that grasping, clinging feeling that we can have. And then the disorganized that does a bit of both. And all of them get to be normalized because life does get lively and invite all of them in different ways and can be more or less adaptive at different times. But what we're looking for is secure attachment. And so I'm not inviting you with patients and clients and families to stare at them like you were the kid brother in the back of the station back in the vacation. And when you notice them getting a little like, oh, I'm a double E extrovert. My friends joke, double E is not a cup size. It stands for extra extroverts. And I, you know, when the St. Bernard Cuppy extrovert comes in, I can see the introverts going, oh, dear God. <laughs> the St. Bernard Cuppy has locked eyes with me and has seen the introvert and is on her way to me. Someone divert, divert, someone, I don't even have a social beer with a cup of coffee. Somebody make her go away. And so it can be overwhelming and intimidating to have the intensity of someone really seeing us. So we use the attunement to notice when our sustained gaze that can feel soft, and they're also culturally, there are also differences about eye contact. And so we stay attuned and we notice, but when we can offer eye contact in a way that gives warmth and connection, and that says that I'm attuned to you, I see you, 
When someone is not tracking with us and we feel misattuned, then it triggers the threat arousal system in us. Because if we're not seen as infants, then the people around us won't notice when we're cold, hungry, hurting, scared, under threat. And they won't know to attend to us and attune to us. And so if people pretend that they're listening, but we can sense that they really aren't, it triggers anxiety in us. And so the more we can find ways to offer those soft, kind eyes, you know that person that looks at you, hopefully you've had at some point in your life, and you can have now, who when they look at you, you know that you know that you know that they just adore you. When we can give people that safe space, it says, I believe in you, you've got this, well, you do not alone, I'm with you. We create a safe space so that they can process through whatever they need to. They can be with whatever they need to. To know that they're not alone. The research shows that the two greatest predictors of whether or not we'll develop PTSD after a potentially traumatic event, they're only potentially traumatic based on the stories we tell ourselves about them. The two greatest predictors of whether we'll develop PTSD are how well we felt like we were able to take action on our own behalf during and after the potentially traumatic event, and how well we felt we had support both during and after the potentially traumatic event. <clears throat> That's directly correlated with whether or not we'll develop PTSD, and if we do, how severe the symptoms are and how long they will last. So the opportunity that we have one-on-one -on -one with patients and families and groups, with the people that we're working with, and our colleagues, and our kids, and our partners, and our friends, and the checker at the grocery store. It's when we're present enough with ourselves that we can then be present with them. It's when we are present with them, they can relax to know that someone's with them and they're not alone. They can face what they have to face in a much healthier, easier way. The more we learn to care give that way, then we will completely revolutionize and transform the way caregiving is done because we're doing it from a healthy way rather than a fr frantic and striving way. If we had more time, we would take time to, and I want to get us to lunch because God forbid I get in the way of food. Uh, <laughs> When, if we had more time, I would have one partner share one of the most fun things that you've ever experienced. And I would have the other partner listen, maintaining eye contact, but without saying a word, without making a movement, without making noises, or facial expressions, or head nods. You know that non-verbal cueing we get trained to do? Uh-huh, uh-huh. To encourage people to listen. We overuse that so that we feel like we're doing something, and to manage the conversation. Uh-huh, uh-huh, yeah, 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 I get it, go ahead, hurry up on the top of this, right? We, we non-verbally cue because we feel like we need to do something, but how long, how, when we do this exercise and someone just listens, because then we switch roles, and then the listener becomes the speaker, and vice versa, and the speaker, the second time we do this, do the exercise, are invited to share a not-so-fun experience. And we debrief what comes up, and what often comes up is this, is how hard it is to not make noise or want to join or connect or reach out when someone's hurting, how hard it is to hold that space. But when we do, people say, I have never had anyone sit and just listen to me for two minutes without interrupting. And they say, I haven't ever shared that story with anyone. Because when we leave enough of a vacuum and enough space, because we're tending to our anxiety, we're finding ways to be comfortable with in the presence of discomfort and not be so uncomfortable ourselves. We want to hurry up and make them better so that they'll feel okay, so that we can feel better. When we can hold that space, then they have room to come in and say everything that they need to say because we're not doing anything energetically to stop. You know, like, we're really glad we're not doing that exercise. So, but find ways to pay more attention and to listen and to just be present because when we can offer them that presence, what a difference it can make. And so think about the things that you can change in your own practice for yourself and with others in the next day, the next week, the next month, 
to really not just have had a couple of hours of putting up with a red-headed, left-handed, extroverted Aries, but to really make some substantive changes for yourself. So I'm going to read through this, and then I'll end our time. This is from Rachel Naomi Remen, some of you may know from Kitchen Table Wisdom and My Grandfather's Blessings. She says, perhaps, this is, um, perhaps the most important thing we bring to another person is the silence in us. Not the sort of silence that's filled with unspoken criticism or hard withdrawal, but the sort of silence that's a place of refuge, of rest, of acceptance of someone as they are. We are all hungry for this other silence. It is hard to find. In its presence, we can remember something beyond the moment, a strength on which to build a life. Silence is a place of great power and healing. Silence, she says, is God's flat. Many, th excuse me, many things grow the silence in us. Among them simply growing older, we may then become more a refuge, than a, excuse me, a rescuer, a witness to the process of life and the wisdom of acceptance. A highly skilled AIDS doctor once told me she keeps a picture of her grandmother in her home and says before a few minutes every day before she leaves for work. Her grandmother was an Italian boring woman who held her family close. Her wisdom was of the earth. Once, when Louisa was very small, her kitten was killed in an accident. It was her first experience of death, and she had been devastated. Her parents had encouraged her not to be sad, telling her that her kitten was in heaven now with God. Despite these assurances, she had not been comforted. She had prayed to God, asking God to give her kitten back, but God did not respond. In her anguish, she had turned to her grandmother and asked, Why? Her grandmother had not told her her kitten was in heaven as so many of the other adults had. Instead, she simply held her and reminded her of the time when her grandfather had died. She, too, had prayed to God that God had not brought Grandpa back, and she didn't know why. Louisa had turned into the soft warmth of her grandmother's shoulder then and sobbed. When finally she was able to look up, she saw her grandmother was crying, too. Although her grandmother could not answer her questions, a great loneliness had gone, and she felt able to go on. All the assurances that Peaches was in heaven had not given her the strength or peace. My grandmother was a laugh, Rachel, she told me, a place of refuge. I know a great deal about AIDS, but I, what I really want to be for my patients, or the patients with whom she works, is a laugh, a place from which they can face what they have to face and not be alone. Taking refuge does not mean hiding from life, it means finding a place of strength, the capacity to live the life that we have been given with greater courage and sometimes even with gratitude. So as you continue to do this work, as you continue to live in this life that has gotten, especially life the, these days, if you choose to do a COVID retirement and go find another industry, go take it by storm and take these skills with you there. If you choose to stay, though, then buckle up and let's all work together to find ways to do this better for everyone's sake. Because the people we care for deserve it, but my friends, we deserve it too. Many, many, many blessings. Thank you for your time. Thank you.